Hey everybody, welcome to Adobe Live on Behance. Uh, we are here today to take a look at uh, Premiere Pro with our esteemed guests uh, to my right here. My name is Michael Lewis, I'm with the Premiere Pro team. Um, and quick shout out to uh, a dear colleague of ours that passed away last week, um, Colin Broham. We'll miss you, bro. Um, so. Moving on, um, yeah, we're here this week and we're gonna be working in Premiere Pro. Um, I'm gonna let my esteemed guest introduce himself, Eric. Um, hi, my name's Eric Addison. Um, I run 100 Acre Films based out of San Diego. We're a small production company that does mostly corporate stuff, uh, occasional commercials. Um, I'm also kind of starting to do short films now. Uh, but yeah, we've been around for over 10 years. Um, I think now I'm probably closer to 13 or 14. Um, and also, when I'm not doing all of that, um, I run the San Diego Premiere Pro user group. So I've been using Premiere since it was Premiere Pro, since it was just Premiere. Um, I think my first copy was Premiere 5 back in 98. So I've been all using right. it for yeah. a while now. You know, um, all the ins and outs and the skeletons. I, <laughs> I've been there for the good days and the bad days. So, but, uh, but it's all been, I've always loved Premiere and I think it's a, it's a great tool and it's only getting better, so. Awesome. All right, I just want to uh, also give a shout out to everybody that's in our chat. Uh, Sissy Tazera and James and Siobhan Frazier. Hey, uh, glad to see you all in the chat. Like everybody, let's keep active in the chat. There's like benefits to being active in the chat. So we really want to hear from you. Um, so. Keep that chat active. Um, so I think we also want to go ahead and talk about our schedule this week on Adobe Live. Um, so obviously there's myself and Eric today with Premiere Pro talking about uh, those real world workflows and uh, even a couple of other products around that. We have Caitlin Cato coming up, um, Isaac and Dusty Gridley with Character Animator, and Mark Edward Lewis, no relation, um, who will be talking about audition and audio. That guy so, knows his stuff. Does he know his stuff? He knows right. his stuff. We had him at our user group about a month or so ago, and he is insanely smart. Awesome. So definitely stick around. Check out some of those uh, those other sessions that are happening today. You know, take the day off, get a cup of coffee, hang with us. Hey, Mukal. Um, hey there. Uh, let's see. Joseph, good morning. Uh, glad everybody's here. So um, I think we are supposed to make these intros really short so that we can get right into it with everyone. Um, hi, Anna. Um, so, Eric, I'm going to let you go ahead and start uh, getting into the product. Okay. So, what I'm going to talk about today, so I'm going to be here for three days. Um, each day I'm going to talk about a different kind of project that uh, I work on. So, today I'm going to focus on um, a project that we do every year for one of our clients. Um, uh, that's sort of, it's not really an event video, but we shoot at a trade show and we have to turn videos around uh, really fast. Uh, we normally shoot for a couple of days in Las Vegas for the Consumer Electronics Show for one of our clients, um, Qualcomm. Um, and we have to turn around about 13 videos in the span of seven days. And they're about two to three minute videos. So we had to kind of come up with a workflow that allows us to do that. Um, tomorrow, we'll be, uh, we'll be talking about uh, kind of showing how I worked on, I did a short film and how I used Premiere in my workflow for that. And then the last day, I'm going to kind of talk about uh, a little mini documentary we did for one of our corporate clients and the workflow around that. So, so that's kind of the plan. So to tease to, for all of you viewers to come back and watch the, the next couple days. Um, but today, uh, I am going to talk about this trade show video and kind of how I did that. Um, and I'm going to start with actually, well, I'll show a little bit. I can't show too much of the video because technically it's under NDA uh, and some of the information contained in here I can't show. But just to kind of give you a quick flavor of like how it starts off. I don't know if you can hear it, but we've just got some cool music. CES is a very important show for us. We have to think about Qualcomm Booth as a representation of what the company is about. Okay, so that's kind of what the video is. It's, this is what we call the overview, overview video. Um, we do The first video that we do for the trade show is just an overview. It's for all the internal employees at the company to sort of say, hey, you know, it's a global company, so they, they, the uh, employee communications team wants to kind of show the rest of the world, like, hey, the stuff you're working on is really cool, so here's right. what it is. It's at the trade show, and everybody loves it. So where we start um, is... Uh, well, we actually shoot everything. So our normal schedule is we shoot 
uh, for one day. We come back and ingest all the footage. We go back and shoot another day, ingest all the footage, and then start editing. And we edit the overview video first. And then after that, we spend a full day just editing all the rest of the videos. Where we all start, though, is in Prelude. Um, I'm gonna switch over to Prelude here. So do you have like a, is it a fast turnaround on these? Or yes. do you have time? Yeah, so we so we shoot those two days. The, at the end of the second day, we have to have the overview video, overview video done by the next morning. Right. So we edit all night until it's done. Um, the rest of the videos we edit, um, so we usually get, we start shooting Tuesday, we shoot Wednesday, have the first video done for Thursday morning. Thursday we edit all day. Mm -hmm. We Friday we rest and fly home from Las Vegas, and then Monday we're, we're back in the studio editing the rest of the videos, and they roll them out Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, the rest of that week, so yeah. So you really need an efficient pipeline we, there. Exactly, we've right. gotta get stuff done super quick. Awesome. So one thing that really helps us is Prelude. Um, so for those of you who've never used Prelude before and don't know what it is, this is Prelude. Dear to my heart. <laughs> <laughs> it is one of the most undervalued apps, I think, that it's just this app that lives in Creative Cloud that a lot of people don't know about, and it's really, really cool. It does a lot of cool stuff. Some of the stuff you can actually do inside Premiere, um, and I, I can kind of talk about that, uh, but I prefer to do it all in Prelude. It's still my app of choice. Right. So. Right. So what you normally do in Prelude is you would ingest. So for instance, uh, we have a, we usually shoot, for this particular video, we shoot everything HD on, on SDHC cards. So when we get back to our hotel room at the end of the shoot day, we'll put the card into our laptop, we click the ingest tab, and then this will show you all the clips on the card. And you can kind of see here, everything's labeled. Um, it gives you, you know, the shoot, the shot date, the make of the camera, all that stuff. And we usually want to bring everything over, so I just use the click all or check all button. And then that'll highlight everything. Um, and then this panel over here where it says transfer, this is like the really cool part of Prelude. So what Prelude will do is pull the footage in from the card. You can choose where to send it to. So you can have a primary destination, which will be this folder. You can create a subfolder if you need to. If you need to transcode it to something else, you can click transcode, choose your format, you know, and then it'll it'll send it there um, and transcode it with Adobe Media Encoder. The verify button down here on the bottom, that's the really key part. So for instance, with this particular show, sometimes we will go back to the room and dump footage in the middle of the day and then send the card back out. We don't like to do that, but mm. sometimes that happens. Right. So the verify button will verify everything that comes off the card and is going onto the hard drive is exactly as it should be. Right. And so, say, like safety and yes. peace of mind. Yes, right. absolutely. Um, I always recommend if you're going to do this, dump your footage in two places, uh -huh. at least two places. Always uh, have a backup. <laughs> yeah. Always have a backup. Um, so yeah, so you can click verify, that will verify everything. And then once you click ingest down here at the bottom, which I don't know that you can really see. Let me try to zoom in here. I'm gonna say a quick hello. I see a few more people in there. Patrick Palmer, hey Patrick. Um, and uh, there was an Ola, who is that? I saw, I love that. Uh, Ola back, I'm sorry, I think you've already gone off my screen. Um, Dominic waving back at you. Uh, everybody stay active in the uh, the chat there. Please send us questions as, uh, as Eric goes along. And don't forget to check out the challenge tab. We have a challenge coming up, it'll be cool. Um, it'll definitely put us on the spot as judges. All right. <laughs> so anyway, so once we get our footage ingested, I click the ingest button, everything will be over here. And you can, it's just like Premiere, you can do it in an icon view and you can kind of scrub through things or you can look at it in the list view. But this is the part that we found really helps us once we get started in editing. So I'm gonna come over here to this tab that's the metadata tab. And in here we can start tagging clips. Mm -hmm. So for instance, you know, and I've kind of done some of the clips already here. You can see this particular clip. Let me make these thumbnails a little bit bigger. So this particular clip is a product at their booth that's a wireless router. So over in the metadata tab, in the description, let's see if I can zoom in on that. In the description here, in this tab, uh, let me move this thing out of the way. You can see I've typed in wireless router IoT. So wireless router is what the product is. IoT is what I know the video will be mm -hmm. um, that will be focusing and using that, possibly using that clip. So, um, so I'll go through and do that for a number of the clips here. So we'll go through and tag all of them using the metadata. So that once we get into Premiere, it's real easy to use the search tab to find what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. So we'll do all that. 
Um, then we'll go back into Premiere. And if I import in the clips here, so let's see, I have this clip, uh, day three added B-roll. Let me, oops, let me import that in. Actually, I'm gonna use the media browser to do that. Um, let's see, day three B-roll. We're just gonna select all of it and import. And that'll import all that in. So there are people uh, kind of asking, what does Prelude do? And I think you've addressed that a little bit. I'm not sure if we've answered that question for them yet. But um, do you want to like, I, I know you're kind of in the middle of it, but. Yeah. So pre like I said, Prelude is, is usually for ingesting. Um, its primary function, I would say, would be for ingesting um, your footage from your card. You can also add the metadata, as I showed here, um, that can translate over. But you can also build rough cuts. So if you were needing to just sort of string a bunch of clips together, let's say you were on set and you were, let's say you're working on a short film and you shot a bunch of scenes and you wanted to see how they cut together. Like, do I have the coverage that I need? Is this going to work? What you can do is sort of, instead of having to open up Premiere and, and do everything there, if you just need to put the clips together, Prelude is a real fast way to, to get the clips in. Um, you don't even have to, in, when I say ingest, you can ingest and copy right. them onto your uh, hard drive, but you can also just ingest them into Prelude and not remove them from the card. And because uh, I've done this before, and you can just drag the clips down and sort of rough cut out the scene using Prelude to sort of say, yeah, this scene works, or you know what? No, we need to get that close right, up, or right. we need to get that shot. Pull the card back out and keep shooting. Right. So, so Prelude actually has a lot of cool things that you can do with it beyond just ingesting and metadata and tagging. Awesome. So, and I'll talk more, a little bit more about Prelude and, and how I used it to set up my short film tomorrow, creating bins and, and selecting clips from different takes and things like that. Perfect. Awesome. So, so come back tomorrow. Come back tomorrow. Um, all right, so here's the footage that we brought in. Um, you can see the two clips that I tagged, Wireless Router, in the description. Here it is in Premiere. And if I come up to my search menu here, which uh, doesn't seem to be working right now for some reason, but normally I would just type in wireless router and that would work. Uh, for some reason it's not right now. So that's awesome. Um, it's because you're live. It's because yeah, I'm live. Yeah. So, but anyway. Um, so, so that's that. So after that, like, <laughs> that's really awesome that it's not working right now because <laughs> <laughs> that was the next part of how, what I was going to show is how we search for things. But I can kind of show you, so for instance, let's look at my day one, camera one, card, or camera one, card one. So you can see in the description right here, we have everything tagged from when we actually did the project. So let me kind of come in here. This little thing's kind of super annoying. Um, so you can see we've got description of B-roll, interview, who the interview's with, what video it'll mostly go, it look likely fit into, B-roll of phones, they're using the Snapdragon processor, on and on and on. So we use all of that information to help us find the clips right. once we start editing. Because the client will sit in the room and say, hey, this would be a good time for um, a shot of a smartphone. So we can type in smartphone and boom, all the smartphone right. clips will come up. So we'll figure it out and have that working uh, at some point, probably tomorrow. Yes. 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 <laughs> Not sure why. Of course, it's live. It's, it's, it, it craps out on me there. Um, the other thing, too, uh, that I'll mention, uh, talking about working efficiently and, and you know, uh, having a workflow that, that helps you move quickly, is have a, I always tell editors, have a system. Right. You know, we, what we've done is we've created uh, folders for day one, day two, and then day three. Um, we had to go back and shoot a little extra B-roll this year. But you can see within the day one folder, and here, maybe I should zoom in on that a little bit more. I'm still getting used to this zooming in thing. Um, day one, we have camera one, camera two, camera three. We do card one, card two, same with camera two, and same with camera three. That way, we know, we have everything broken out so it's real quick to find, because right. usually card one is the morning, card two is the afternoon. So a lot of times, if for some reason we're still having trouble, the metadata tagging isn't working, the client can say, <laughs> you know what, we shot that in the afternoon of the second day. Right. Boom. We know that's going to be card two and what camera did that, and so we can easily find the clips that way as well. But it's really important to have a system, yeah. to, to develop some sort of system. I like to say that, uh, you know, oh, the other important thing is to keep it consistent, to always use it. And I always like to say that, and it sounds a little morbid maybe, but if I were to die and somebody needed to come in and take over this project, right. they could open it up, figure things out, and be able to finish the project. Right. You know, And so you, you know, I always encourage editors for your own sanity and to help you along, develop your own system for organization and, uh, and stick with it. 
Um, I like right. how you kind of turn that around on the metadata search. If that's not working, then your organization is your backup here. That was that was very smooth. <laughs> Thank well, you. it's it's you know <laughs> listen. There's more than one way to do things, right. and so it's exactly. always important to you know have to have a backup plan. So you know. Um, okay, so the next thing I was going to talk about is uh, interviews. So if we go back to, let me zoom back out here. Oops, I'll get used to that at some point here. Um, okay, so the next thing we have to do is we shoot a lot of interviews for this. And so what we normally do is we put together an interview sequence. And let me find where that is, because my search thing isn't working. Here it is, interviews. So this sequence here contains all of the interviews that we shot. We string them all together. We sync up the cameras, um, and and then we're able to play them back. You can see that's camera one, and that's camera two, and so this allows us to very quickly. You know, it is really exciting to be here at CES to play back everything. And we sit in the hotel room with the client and we say, okay, let's start, you know, who's gonna be, so we're gonna work on the overview video. Who's gonna be in this video? It'll be this person and this person. So we'll find them, we'll play their interview back for the client, um, and then let them tell us the sound bites that they like. And the way we normally work that is, we do what's called a pancake timeline. Okay. So we take this, I'm gonna just use this uh, time sequence here. So I'll drag that underneath. So we stack them together like this. So we have uh, them stacked one on top of the other. So you have two sequence windows open. I have two sequence windows open. Right, got it. Okay. So as we play through, like let me find some one sound bite. So we might play this particular person here. Every customer. So we might like this sound bite. And you can see we did like it because I've got cuts on either side of it. Right. But what I can do now is I can just drag this down to the sequence and boom, that clip is now in there. Right. And I will just keep going, dragging stuff down, building what I like to call the narrative of it. Because if you look at this video, it's really just a bunch of sound bites all strung together. Right. These are all just sound bites. This is all dialogue right here. So, so we'll just use this method to sort of quickly go through and pull down the interview sound bites. Now, you notice what I've got here is two, uh, two tracks, camera uh, B and camera A. I could multicam this right. and pick between the two, and I know a lot of editors who love to edit the multicam way. That's another good way to go. For me personally, this makes sense. I can't explain why. It's just the way I like to edit. So that's the way I do it. I have done multicam between right. multiple cameras and edited that way and pulled it down, and that's a total, uh, total reliable workflow. But I don't know, just the way my brain's wired, right. I go this well, I think way. that's the beauty of um, a lot of Adobe products is that you can actually find your workflow yep. and do things your way. There's no one way to get uh, through a project and one workflow you have to stick to. You can really build as you want and what makes you comfortable, yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's that I agree with you. Uh, there's usually one more than one way to skin a cat, so to speak, in Premiere or in any of the Adobe apps. Right. Like you don't, they don't lock you into just one workflow. There's multiple ways to do it, and you know if you don't like one way, the other way is most likely going to be just as good and the way you like to work. So always be open to that. Um, all right, so once we did that, we drag all the clips down. You can see, again, this is just sort of a string out of all these interviews. Um, so we'll build the interviews, um, and then once we get the interviews all lined up, what we like to do then is then put in the B-roll. So we get the story built, and then we just start slugging in B-roll, and that's really where that meta tagging comes in, where we can really kind of go through and search for stuff. So we have a question yeah. um, just before you move on yep. from Simon. Oh, I'm going to mess up your last name, Simon. I'm sorry. Parathoner. Um, so everything is cut two times for two cameras. Is that? Um, well, if so, let me go back to the interview timeline. Um, you can see that I think I understand what your question is. You can see that what we've done is we've stacked the clips, and so what I use to cut instead of just using the uh, the razor tool, I use a Control K command. And so let me show you here. So if I come into this particular point on the clip, you can see first of all. You got to, in order to do this, you have to have both tracks selected. So if I come over here, you can see I've got video one and video two selected. And then if we come back out, if I use uh, Control K or Command K on a Mac, you can see it it makes that cut in both those tracks. 
So yeah, so as I'm going through, I'm just you know uh, control K where I want the edit to happen, and it's cutting both clips for me, and then I just drag both of them down. So I think that hopefully that answers your question. If not, let me know, and I'll try to answer it better. So, awesome. Um, but yeah, keyboard shortcuts, learn those. I see somebody has mentioned shortcuts are the best. Yes. Shortcuts are the best. <laughs> shortcuts are the best. So um, all right, so let me go back here. Um, so the next thing, let's see, what's the next thing I want to talk about? Uh, did that, oh, lower thirds, ah. Okay, so let me zoom in here. So we've got a lower third here. Um, and so we're set up this year, kind of similar to what we have in the past. So this lower third, uh, we don't have a lot of time to build lower thirds. Mm -hmm. We just don't. Um, so Which we, is true of a lot, yeah, a lot of yeah, people, yeah, especially on this. So and the client knows that the client's really pretty uh, flexible with us. They know. I mean, we don't do a lot of fancy transitions in this. We just got to build these things and spit them out. So it's right. a lot of cuts, maybe dissolves, and so basic lower thirds work for this client. So one nice thing uh, that we're able to leverage, um, if we go into the graphics setup here. Um, Let's do this, buddy. There we go. Uh, we've got all of the uh, templates now. Mm -hmm. inside, And so you've got choices through Adobe Stock that you can get uh, lower thirds from. There's also a ton of free ones inside Premiere. There's some third-party ones that we've gotten a hold of. Um, this one that I've used in this video was actually a free one that it comes with Premiere. And so... Right, and this uh, this was enhanced this last uh, release that we just did at NAB. Mm -hmm. This being back from NAB NAB yes. uh, sessions, um, so that you can actually do searches uh, not just within what you have installed, but on the cloud and libraries. So it's check it out. It's uh, it's been enhanced so that you have more options for uh, the templates you have access to. Yeah. Yeah, it's really it's a great system, a great setup. So so yeah, uh, I'm gonna sorry, yeah, I'm gonna go answer one question. Um, so. Uh, Sisse Tezera is asking, doesn't a pancake timeline strain your computer? So um, I, I'll answer that. I don't, um, because you're only actually viewing one timeline at a time, it's not as if it's doing a composition. If you were viewing eight different tracks all at the same time of 8K footage, that would be straining your, your uh, computer for sure. But the way that this is happening, it's just you're only viewing what's the selected timeline at the time that you're looking at it, so it's not going to strain your computer. Yeah, absolutely. it's kind of the same as typing between sequences. Um, you just happen to see both of them at the same time. Right. Um, yeah, you're only playing one at a time. You're only so. playing one at a time. Yeah. So thank you. I was trying to figure out the simplest way to say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so well, and I would say too, one other thing that, that can help with that if you're seeing that problem is to make sure, and, and I don't know how your system is particularly set up, but make sure that your footage isn't on your system drive. Mm. You know, If you can have it set up on an external drive or on a separate drive, that will help them play back too. Right. This is for sure. you know, I always encourage people to make sure, so like this particular laptop, that this is my edit laptop when I go out in the field, and it has two hard drives. This system hard drive, which is an SSD, and then it has a two terabyte internal drive um, nice. that I can put media on. And then it also has uh, Thunderbolt 3. Right. Um, so I'm editing. I'm fast using connection. That. To fast connection. So yeah. yeah, having that fast connection if you can. But having the, the footage on another drive will help if you're seeing playback issues. So, um, All right, so the lower third. So this, like I said, this was just a lower third that I drug down and built. Um, you can see if I drag this down, I'm just dragging it from the Essential Graphics panel on here, I'll just to sort of re-show you how it was done. Um, there we go. And so it's got all this stuff to just to sort of go in, and I can just use the title tool and put in the name. So I'll just create one with my name for this one. And die on the live stream. <laughs> so, so anyway, so it's that simple. Boom, my lower third's done. IoT section on automotive. My lower third's done. I don't have to worry about this. And the client, nine times out of 10, is gonna love it just because it does the trick. It even matches the blue, that blue kind of flare thing there that starts with, matches the blue of their booth. Right. So it worked out perfect. Um, and then I can go in if I need to and actually edit the intro duration, the outro duration, um, which is really nice. And right. if you really wanna get kind of in the weeds, you can go to, let me go back to the, uh, oops, that's not the workspace I wanna go to. 
Let's go to uh, this works for us. So while Eric's looking for this, um, the editing the outro and intro duration is about the animation of the lower third. And so what you can do is you can set it so that that duration is always the same. Is that what you're about to show? Yeah. yeah. So go, yeah, well, yeah, well, I was just going to say, you have access to all the keyframes. So you can right. totally go in and customize it as you need to. You have, you know, it isn't just like you drop it on and then you're stuck with it. You can go in and change things up a bit. Um, I can even just sort of drag this, you know, and it'll, <laughs> it'll sort of just sort of change up as I need it to. So um, it's really nice. It's nice, responsive. It works great, super simple, which is what awesome. I like for this. So Yeah, keep that workflow efficient. Exactly. Um, all right, so we got that. So let's see, the next thing. Oh, uh, audio. So if you listen to this right now, let's get in a little further here. Or someone's talking. Very important show for us. I mean, you have to think about quality. Okay, so mixing the audio is come with the right level is something that we always have to do. For something like this, it's kind of simple because it's just uh, it's it's mostly voiceover. Mm -hmm. But the auto ducking feature inside Premiere Now is making life even that much simpler. So all of the let me set up this by saying all of the tracks here, um, all the voiceover tracks have been tagged as dialogue when right. you go into the audio panel. So they're marked as dialogue. You have to do that for this work workflow to work. Then I just have to select the audio track. Do you mind, um, do you mind walking through just adding, oh, yeah. showing so, how you would yep. add? So I'm going to select this clip here. So this clip, let me clear the audio type. So, so I've got this clip right here on my timeline. This is a, a sound bite. So what I'm going to do is just click on that, come up to where it says dialogue and click dialogue, and now that tells Premiere that particular sound clip, that that's a dialogue clip, to see it as dialogue. Right. So it's, it's almost like a just a metadata tag, exactly, in a yeah. sense. So, but once I've done that, I can then say to Premiere, okay, this is a, I want to label this particular sound file as a music track. So now it's tagged that as music, and let's come in kind of tight here. And you can see over here, You've got a new feature called ducking. And if I turn that on, let's uh, go back out. If I turn that on, it should, should work here. Why isn't it doing that now? <laughs> okay, come on, buddy. It should start letting me auto duck it. And it's not. That's awesome. Let's try this one more time. Let's clear the audio type. It always works in rehearsal. Ducking. Okay, well, I'm not sure why that's not working now, but it should <laughs> auto duck, and it should uh, bring down the level based on when the voiceover starts. And I'm not sure why it's not. Any other thoughts on your um, part? <laughs> I'm wondering if there's a uh, permissions issue going on with your files, actually. No. Was this working earlier? This was working earlier. This was working earlier. Let me okay. try this. Let me clear uh, audio type. Let me relabel all of that as dialogue. OK, so let's come back here now. Let's clear this audio type. Well, there's always restart. <laughs> yes. Awesome. OK, well, when it does work, and we could try restarting it. Yeah, if, yeah. I mean, just Premiere, like maybe we just need to. Yeah, let me try closing Premiere and reopening it here. So, so. while we're doing that, um, is there, are there any questions? Um, click on the ducking, just needs to click on the ducking tab. Patrick Palmer, our Premiere uh. Pro expert. We're missing. Thanks, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Patrick Palmer is the Premiere Pro product manager, so he's a. Uh, Let's try this He's again. He's the guy to ask. OK, music, ducking. Ah! ah! It always helps to have an expert in the yes. uh, chat. Thank you. OK, so we're back in business. It does work. And there's uh, Duran. Duran, you're supposed to be in here. Yeah, yeah, Duran, where are you? <laughs> um, all right, so all I have to now is click Generate Keyframes. And you can watch Premiere will create the keyframes for me at the beginning of the track, because let's face it, the rest of this track is all voiceover stuff, so it doesn't really, this isn't gonna be the best example for auto-ducking, but again, it you can see it created those keyframes right at the beginning of the track for me. Let's just 
just go to where it ducks down. Now, you notice that the auto ducking kind of duck the music a little too soon, which is fine because I can just go in and I can move those keyframes nice. just like that. So it allows me to do that. So, boom, I'm in. Now, oh, I got I adjusted that keyframe, so let's go right there. CES is very important. Nice. That's, that's there works. we go. So now it works. And again, when it's two in the morning and I'm trying to edit this to get it done, that feature is awesome because it's one less thing I need to go in and futz with. Right. Um, and you do have all of the controls over here in the ducking panel, the sensitivity, the reduced by the fades. So you can go in and customize it. If I had a lot more spots where you know the music would need to come up because no one was talking, that's where those would probably come in handy, and I could really sort of finesse it, and you'd see that. But for this example, you know, the only spot is really at the beginning and probably at the end where we'll have that where we would need the the music to really change. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in here. It looks like mm -hmm. we're getting close to our giveaway time, and. Um, what that means is that you want to be active in our chat because if you're active in our chat, you may get to win this awesome, actually I may need to take a nap on this after this, this awesome uh, pillow. So get active in the chat, try to, you know, all you have to do is say hi, but try and be creative. Like actually tell us where you're from again. I saw Italy, I've seen a couple of other places, um, Munich, so, or maybe that's somebody asking if someone's in Munich. But um, yeah, just be active in the chat and then you will be randomly selected to win this awesome Creative Cloud pillow. So I'm gonna put that right here so you know that this is the cool thing you could win. Um, and I'll let you know um, as the time comes down to um, where we do the random selection. All right. I'm um, sorry. I'm, I'm, um, okay. Okay. So yeah. So go ahead, uh, like Eric. Go ahead and um, okay. Finish. So um, one thing I was going to say too. I noticed there was a question um, that somebody had. Brazil. About, <laughs> bon dia. No, that's the wrong one. Bon dia. <laughs> somebody had a question about color. Um, shooting under um, when we're shooting, you know, uh, oh, like under mixed lights and things like that, how we deal with the colors and stuff. And that's actually the next thing I was going to talk about. Awesome. So, um, hey Morocco, hey Russia, Poland, welcome to the house. <laughs> wow, there's a lot of people from... Yeah, we've got a awesome. really global audience here. That's awesome. This is great. Also U.S. Well, yeah, welcome to U.S. <laughs> <laughs> um, so to talk about color, one thing uh, I wanted to show, um, I'm, I'm sure most of you have seen, the everybody knows about the new color match feature, and that's an awesome feature. Um, maybe we'll talk about that in the next day or two on one of the other demos, but something that I wanted to show that uh, sort of has come off, that's a new feature that, that not necessarily color match, but employs the, the dual, you know, seeing two clips at the same time, right. um, is, is this feature here. So. When we go out to shoot, we always use color charts. I always recommend if you're going to go out and shoot, you should have a color chart. It will make your life a lot easier once you get into post. Um, we have two different sizes. We have the small size uh, that fits in your, in your hand, and then we have a larger size, uh, or I should say this fits in your pocket, and then a larger color chart. Uh, when we're running and gunning like we do on this particular show, we just use the small one. But what's nice now is, um, let me get rid of the uh, effects on this. Come over here. I'm going to come to uh, the color tools. Let's open up the color panel. There we go. And I'm going to go to my effects controls. Let's clear out what I have here. Oh, wait. We have a winner. Oh, we do? We do already. This is amazing. All right. So the winner of our Creative Cloud pillow is Rod Johnson. Rod Johnson, you are the winner. We will, uh, someone here knows how to like make this happen. So it will, it will happen. Um, and, and um, hmm? Adobe Live will know. Adobe Live. Adobe Live will know how to, we'll, we'll contact you. Sorry, Andreas, I was pulling for you. I know how that is when you don't, you're not the one decorating your apartment, but uh, Rod Johnson won. Thanks, you guys, for participating. That was awesome. All right. right. These pillows are nice. I know. It's, it's, it's really cushy. Like, I, like, I'm making myself not. <laughs> <laughs> um. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. <laughs> um. So anyway, so yeah, always shoot with a chart if you can. Um, and I'll show you why. So if we come to our scopes here, um, and I'm going to go into my 
split view here, my comparison view, you can see I've got it set up to, I can set it up to look at both, this is camera A and this is camera B from the same shot. And so let me set up them so, so they're side by side. So what I can do is if you look here in your um, RGB parade, you can tell the values, the differences between them. You can see like the blue on one side is a little bit higher or lower than the blue on the other, you know, the green. So I can go through and start making adjustments. So let me take this clip. Um, it looks like my highlights are a little off, so I'm gonna come over my highlights. I'm gonna drag the, I'm gonna drag it away from the blue to bring those blues down. Um, let's see, and then I'm gonna come up on my tint, maybe knock down that green a little bit. Uh, let's see, get it right about there. I've still got, a, looking at the red here, that red's a little bit hot, so let me come back over here. So dial that down. So you get them to where they're, oops, I wanna get that green too much. Let me boost, let me boost my highlights on this clip a little bit. So I'll bring that up to where they're about level. And I'm still a little, little hot on that green on this side, so let me bring that down a little bit. So that's a little bit better. So you can see now, I'm just using the split view, the comparison view, I can dial in the color values, get the levels at right, get better. Like in, I'm still a little bit off here in my midtones on this one. So if I come here, I can uh, sort of adjust my blue, get that. So that looks pretty good right there. Um, so yeah, that doesn't look too bad. It's still a little hot over on the red, so I can probably work on that a little bit. But um, but for right now, for our purposes, that we'll say that works. So. But yeah, so that's another way to use the comparison tool. I mean, yeah, you have the auto match feature, um, which is great, apply match, I can use that. Um, but you know, for this, if I have the chart, using the chart, I can really dial in those mm -hmm. colors and kind of using the scopes, get them to where I want them to be. Um, that little green, still a little too much green, so that's starting And where to in your workflow do you typically start working on color? Last, last. So um, that's always the last thing we do, just because you know, as you go through revisions, you never know what's going to get cut out. So I don't want to spend a lot of time uh, color correcting shots that are ultimately going to get cut from the video. Right. You know, um, one thing I will say though is when you're working on projects that don't have this kind of turnaround, a lot of times if it's if we're doing a lot of interviews, right. um, like the the piece that I'm going to show mm -hmm. on um, Thursday. That's something where we have a lot of time to work on. And so what we'll do is go through and color grade some of the interviews. We shoot everything log. This, right. this oh, isn't well, log. Right. right. But uh, just again, because it's more work to color. And log is? Log is a way to shoot that's very flat. It gives you more dynamic range. Um, again, when you're shooting event stuff, like if, I, if you're shooting weddings or shooting any kind of event stuff, don't shoot log. Right. You know, <laughs> because it's just going to be more work in post. Just shoot your standard Rec 709. If you want to create something that's really pretty, that and you've got a lot of time, you know, shoot log. We shot my short film log. We, I shoot all my corporate stuff log mostly. And but anyway, what I was gonna say is for that kind of stuff, what we'll do is go through and, and actually um, color grade the interviews and add it as a master clip effect. Oh, okay. Right. And, and I'll kind of talk about that on Thursday. Awesome. That way, it's on there. You know, and if we need to do a color grade later, we can always just add on top of that. But that sort of balances out things right from the start because we know that's right. not going to change. So using the master clip effect is a great way right. to do that. So that's a uh, this conversation is a great um, way to say like uh, check out the challenge because it's about it's about color and color grading, and uh, we're going to do some some judging of of your. Uh, your color grading skills. So check out the challenge. Uh, download those videos. Submit some some pieces for us to judge. Um, I see an interview or an interview a question um, from Caitlin Howe asking what chipset was used for this shot. Um, this is the X Rite uh, little passport checker or something like that. I think it's like the passport. I think is what they call it. Um, but yeah, I have an X Rite. Uh, larger one and then the smaller one as well. So everything's x right. But there's a there's a number of brands out there you can use. Right. So just find one that works for you and your budget. You're consistent, you're fine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's another thing. Yeah. Whenever you sh change your lighting setup, whenever you, you know, move to a different location, pull out that color chart and shoot in it. Especially 
I would recommend if you shoot trade show videos, if you ever get the chance to work on a project like that, the lighting, especially like the lighting in this booth was all over the place. Right. And you know, they had a lot of blue lights because that's their branding color. And so it was tough to know when we sat down, it's like, okay, is this just not white balance right? Or right. is this, you know, is this just the light in the space? Having the chart lets you know that because nice. you can say, okay, well, I know this is white, and this is probably, you know, this is a light, and we can kind of just use that tool. So again, it's, you know, I, I think these things run maybe like 69 bucks. It could be a lot of money, but it's an investment that you'll be glad you had later on. Right. I mean, I've, since I've started shooting with it, it's changed the, the way I shoot and edit and color correct. And with the Lumetri tools being as powerful as they are now, you can see you can dial in just right away. So, um, let's see. So what was I going to talk about next? We did the auto deck and we did that. Oh, and then the last thing that we do when we're all done is just the encode. Um, but you know, I think everybody here knows how to encode, so don't really need to cover that unless you really want to see me hit, you know, Alt M. Oops. Let me come back here. Contr uh, sorry, it's Control M. Control. Yeah, there we go. And to bring up my stuff, we just use the H.264, and I always use the YouTube 1080 preset. It works great. Yeah. So, so. are you? Is that? Is that because you're posting to YouTube, or is that so, just a... Well, that's, I like that. Yes, actually, I should talk about that a little bit, yeah. the workflow, the review workflow. So we do post to YouTube. Um, normally, I have a client review system that we use. We use either Frame.io or mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but because this is at such a fast turnaround, a lot of times we've had the clients um, sit in with us, we do the edit, and then they leave. And actually, it's it's like a big trade show with a lot of parties. They want to go to the parties because they work for the company. They have right. to go out. And so we post to YouTube because they can review the videos on their phone, on the YouTube app. So we created right. a private link that only they have. And I had a, one of the clients tell me that they, were, they ran to the bathroom at a party to watch the video in the bathroom because it was the only quiet place they could find. And then sent me a note saying, hey, change this, change this, otherwise the video looks great. So. Yeah, posting to YouTube for review works great, and you can set it up right from the media um, encoder settings. Come back there. For those of you who don't know this, um, where the publish tab is, you can choose. Uh, if we scroll down some more, Twitter, did I miss it? No, it's Vimeo. There's YouTube. There's YouTube. Right. So you can choose YouTube, and it will encode it and post it straight to YouTube. And then, yeah, you just once it's done, you just send the client that private link, and then wait for them to get us the notes back. So yeah, and that, this um, it's it's a funny hidden feature in Premiere because it's actually really useful in that you know if you click on that, you'll see that there's like um, uh, options that are available to you to choose your channel or um, to even add like how you want it if you want it to go up privately or if you want it to go up public. Yep. So there's some really useful. Um, uh, options there for when you publish to any of the the supported platforms that we publish to so um, yeah it's in the it's it's under that little publish tab on the far right and you open it up and like there's all these options there that are great yeah it's the, and yeah it's you know I it, everybody has their own sort of thing of choice I I actually use Vimeo for like posting finished videos mm -hmm. but YouTube is better for just sending out I find for sending out for like quick client review. Um, I mean, everybody has a YouTube app on their phone. It just seems to play smoother. Um, not to knock Vimeo, but you yeah. know, I think it, it's it's great too. But YouTube just seems to work, you know, all the time. And I've had the least amount of uh, you know, complaints about it. So I haven't had any complaints about it. So um, so yeah, it's a great sort of makeshift client, quick client review service. Um, but yeah, you're right. That publish tab, you know, I don't think it gets enough enough talk because yeah, you can really sort of. It's really great just to. Yeah, yeah, just shoot it out. So shoot here, it out. here it is. The, the use publish. It's awesome. Um, <laughs> yes. So um, let's see. We have a couple of questions. Does the background color affect the RGB parade when shooting the color chart? Ah, uh, yes, it does. That's a good question. Um, so let's go back to let's go back to that. Um, so if you look, you can see what I'm looking for is, and let's see if I can just kind of zoom in here on the. There we go. Um, there we go. So what I'm really looking for is, let's see if I can kind of split the difference here. So right here, these stripes right here are the things that are right here, right here, and down here. So uh, those are what I'm looking for. I'm not worried about all the other stuff 
that's in the background, I'm just locking on to these things because those are the those are these stripes on each side. So those are what I want to get level. The if you come over here, so these right here are is the highlights. It's this white bar. So I want to get those blues to match. And the same with the greens and the same with the reds. You want to dial them in, you know, spend the time to make sure you get all of them and then go down and do the same for this middle one, which is your your midtones. And then you've got some that are down here, then your blacks, which you really can't see, but they're kind of right in through here. Um, so that's what I'm using dial in. So all the rest of the stuff, I'm not too concerned about. I'm just ignoring that at this point. Um, but you do want to make sure that you've got the chart in the right place under the same light as, you know, for each camera. You don't want to have one under a little bit more favoring one light than the other because that could kind of throw you off. Yeah, thanks for the, for the question, Juha. Mm -hmm. Is there any other questions we should answer, or is um, that the only one? You know, it's this computer is actually blocking me just a little bit. Let me see. <laughs> I'm trying to see. I don't see any right now. Yeah, I don't see any right now, so I think okay. we're, we're good. Yeah, but if you have questions on anything that Eric's presenting, please yeah. throw us a, throw it out. We'll stop and answer it. Um, so let's talk about, um, so we covered the color. Um, we can kind of, I, I showed the metadata stuff, which is, uh, let me go back to my normal view here, come out of this. All right. Um, one other thing you can kind of see that I've done here too that's a little workflow shortcut that we can kind of talk about is um, tagging or using uh, markers on clips. So that's another thing we do. And if I can go back to my interview tab, uh, let's see. Let's go to this view here. Good little shortcut if you don't know this. So I don't know if you caught that or not, but if you have a bunch of bins open and you're in list view like this, you hold down the Alt key on Windows. I'm not sure what it is on Mac. Um, Alt key and then Alt key and then click on this top one. It will close all your bins. Handy little shortcut. Love that. Um, but let's go back to my sequences. Let's find my interview clip. Oh, my search is working now. It's funny. I noticed that. I was like, I don't know why, but there, there we go. Yeah. Sweet. All right. So now you can kind of see. Let's go back to that metadata. So you can see I typed in interview, and now I've got all my interview clips in the description. Um, I've got people, I can search for names. This is great when it works. <laughs> Actually, yes. you want to make this, um, tilt this and just make it big for a second? Oh, yeah. Oops. Oh, sorry. Oh, make it full screen. I got what you're saying. Not that Actually, one. just, just tilt it. There tilt we it. go. There we go. Um, so yeah, so you can see now in my search tab, I have interviews. So all the interview clips are coming up, um, which makes it nice. And so I could search for, you know, um, B-roll, stuff we have labeled as B-roll. Um, why isn't that coming up? <laughs> it should work. Did I misspell something? Let's try interview again. Interview is working. Why isn't B-roll working? Oh, that's why. We have the space. So, yeah, so you can see now everything is Oh, you have to spell correctly. That's no fair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm a horrible speller anyway. Um, so anyway, so yeah, so everything's there for all the B-roll. Um, so yeah, that's, I should say, that's one thing. When you're working with um, two editors, as we do on this project, coming up with nomenclature that's consistent, right. you know, I may type B-roll, he might type B-roll, and that can make all the difference right. in the world. So come, again, come up with a consistent, organized, you know, organized, yeah. you know and then that makes all the difference. Um, okay, so let's go back to this interview sequence here. And uh, that was one thing I wanted to talk about is you can see we've got markers on a lot of this, on uh, clip markers. That's another way to tag stuff. So when we go through with the client and the client might say, you know what, that sound bite, we might want that later on. So can you mark that? We'll go through and so let me click here and play something. If you highlight the clip, so if you, I mean, I'm sure everybody knows how to do markers, but in case you don't, um, if you hit the M key, it will add an, a marker, a sequence time marker, or right. sequence marker, which is right there. But let's undo that. Um, I want to go in and add a marker to this particular clip. Wait, let's see what he says right here. Multiple different devices. Let's go out of comparison view, by the way. So. Design wins across multiple different device segments. And if you walk across the booth, you'll. So that point where he says, and we walk across the booth, we may want to use that for something else. So I'll select the clip hit the M key, and that puts a marker on the clip. And I can go through, and um, if I come up here, I can put in, you know, in the comments, you know, 
I go walk around booth. I can label what that is. So that way when the client later says, hey, where's that one mark? We marked that one thing where he says this and whatever. We have that marked and we can quickly kind of go through the markers and find it. Um, right, and this is actually searchable. So you could actually, mm -hmm. in the bin, in the project panel, do a search on that, that string yeah. and it'll pull up that clip. Uh, walk around booth. See, I just started typing walk and there it was. There it is, yeah. It's right there. So yeah, metadata is a very powerful tool. I can't say that enough. It really can make your editing life a lot easier and go a lot quicker right. and you know, um, so really if it's not a part of your workflow now, definitely think about making it more of your workflow. Uh, yeah, I think I've talked to people and I, you know, I bring up, you bring up metadata and people kind of get bored and fall asleep on you immediately. But if you think of it like tagging, like, you know, like social media, the way that we go, th go through and we are so happy to tag things in our social media platforms mm -hmm. so that you can find them again or other people can find them. Think of it as that. It's like a way of just running through, doing a quick tag and then being able to find that that post that you liked so much. Yeah. You know, that kind of thing. So this is like a great way to, to make your your editing just more efficient, I think, yeah. Um, I see a couple of questions. So uh, can you publish using private FTP? Yes, yes you can. Um, I used to do that all the time. Um, I used to have an FTP set up and then I just stopped using it at a certain point just because YouTube and Vimeo and made it, others, so made it a whole so much yeah. easier. But yeah, if you do have a private FTP, um, let me go back into the uh, settings here. Oops, let's come down here. So you can see in the Publish tab, um, I believe it's right there. There's FTP. So yes, you can do FTP, totally. Um, there's another question about uh, how many cameramen did you have on this shoot? Um, we had, for this particular shoot, we had three camera ops. Uh, we had one that was dedicated strictly camera, um, and then the other two camera ops were myself and another gentleman, but we also doubled as editors as well. Mm -hmm. So the way we structured our days was that the first day, two of us, all three of us went out on the first day, but one of us was only there for a half day. So um, I believe it was myself and the dedicated camera person, whose name was David, he and I shot all day. Patrick, our third um, camera op and also editor, shot for half the day. At the end of the half day, he took all the footage, went back to the hotel room, did the ingest, started meta tagging and doing all that. Um, and then the second day, uh, Patrick and David went out to shoot. I stayed behind um, and kind of took the morning off, which was nice. Right. <laughs> um, and then midday, I went and met them and then got cards from them, came back, started ingesting um, and meta tagging stuff. And then I stayed on to edit the overview video that night. Right. So, and so we had, we had two hard drives for the project that were identical. So mm -hmm. we every so that when Patrick was in one room editing and I was editing in the other room, we both had the same footage, the same structure, everything was the same, so that we could easily swap hard drives if we needed to. Um, and then we had a third. I had a third set of a third backup of everything on the internal drive inside my laptop. Right. So that we had that as well. We wanted to make sure that nothing got lost. Right. Right. You know. Very important. Yeah. Uh, yes. So uh, yeah. So it was essentially two camera people um, every day going out, but we had the ability to shoot with three if we needed to. Um, let's see, is there any easy way to add edit clip descriptions while in icon view? That's a good question. Um, not that I know of. So if you're in the icon view, oh, I see. the only thing you can really do is you can, you can click and rename the, 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 t uh, the clip name here, which doesn't change the file name the real file name, it just changes it inside Premiere. But actually, that's not true. Yes, you can. Now that I think about it. In source view. You Well, you could go to just the metadata tab. You could, yeah. So that would be the, the alternative. So you could just come over here and you can click over here. Look, look let's, select, let's select this clip. And there should be, if I scroll down here, there should be information here. You can you can actually search on the um, if you type description in there you would get it would pull up the fields of the um, if you wanted to get to a field quickly but yeah you can always use the metadata panel. Let me come here to day one. Wait, so I want to follow up on what you said. So so like yeah, so this particular clip I know there's a description here 
in this clip, B-roll, so I could easily go here to make the change, but you're saying I can make the... I well, no, I'm I, just saying, like, rather than scrolling in the panel, you can actually search on the field that you want to change. Oh, just description here? Oh, yeah. And have it pop up for you very easily. See, never think you know it all. <laughs> Every once in a while, you find stuff that, you know, you think, oh, I've been working this way forever. I didn't know you could do that. Right. So that's, that's a handy little shortcut. So, yes, if you're in Icon View, um, just open up the metadata tab uh, inside Premiere. And if you don't see the metadata panel, um, you can easily just go to Window and then select Metadata and then just dock it wherever you need it to go. Uh, but that would be the easiest way to, to do it if you're working in Icon View. Um, how, long does it, how long does the average project take? That depends on the project. Um, if you're talking about if you're talking about these particular projects, these videos that we did for this trade show, right. these generally take between, we edit pretty fast, so six to eight, maybe 10 hours on each of them. Um, the projects that I'll be showing on Friday, or Friday, Thursday, um, which we did for a corporate client, which is more documentary style, that project took day, I mean, we worked on it for months. I went through many, many revisions. You know, if I totaled up all the hours, I don't know. I would say it would take, if we worked on it straight, start to finish, probably over a week. Right. So, yeah. So it, it really depends on the project. You so, know. like, with, with these, with a project like this, right. you're not, are you shooting in log for this project? No. So, so you're not having to deal so much with heavy-duty color correction for this project. Absolutely, yeah. But, like, a, a more creative project is when you shoot in log, and yes. that's going to take longer because you're going to not only is there the edit, but there's also the we're going to do we're going to do yeah stuff for post the sound we're going right. to do more yeah the color correction is going to take longer um, just building the story out we're working from a script it's you know it's going through a lot more revisions and stuff right. and so, like I said we'll talk more about that on Thursday but but yeah this is really sort of you know the client knows that we have to turn stuff around really really fast and so you know they're fine with us just slamming stuff together making it quick and dirty telling the story as fast as possible. Yeah, so, so. thanks Benjamin and Aaron for those questions. And then Kathy, um, did you have a list of questions prior to interviews to use and who prepared those questions from Kathy uh, Lamboro? The client did. So yes, every interview, the, the, we had somebody that was from the company that was with us. We weren't actually doing the questions, um, doing the interviews. We had somebody there mm -hmm. um, who would ask all the questions. So yeah, we didn't have to prepare for that thankfully. Um, let me see, is color correcting in Premiere a good workflow or use speed grade as a better option? You know, I'm not an expert color grader, so, but I will tell you this much, I think that Lumetri has come a long way. I think you can do a lot with Lumetri at this point. I don't, you know, I, I don't know speed grade well enough to say that yes, speed grade is where you should go. Um, you know, I definitely think that you can do a lot in Lumetri. I think that, you know, you should definitely try to, to do as much as you can there. If you find that you're still lacking something, then you can open up speed grade and move the project over there if you need to. Um, but, but yeah, I think Lumetri has gotten to the point where, you know, there's not much you can't do with it anymore for most needs. So, right. uh, okay. should you use the Lumetri color panel in Premiere? Absolutely. Yes, yes, you should. Um, Let's see. Uh, speed grade is dead now. <laughs> it's now Lumetri Color. I don't like to think of speed grade as dead. I think yeah. of it as just on hiatus for a long time. And but as it, Bruce said, like Lumetri is speed grade, so you, it you're is. getting a lot of that, yep. that goodness. In Absolutely. Um, what is this conversation about? <laughs> Wait, are you talking about the chat or are you talking about us? So I, I yeah. think <laughs> we're here to talk about Premiere Pro and um, Eric's workflows uh, in Premiere. And um, he has a couple of different um, types of projects he's going through. So yep. I'll, we're going to let him keep going. Yeah, so let's, um, we can kind of just to sort of show something else that we, um, that we did, one of the other videos here. Uh, let me go to my sequences here. Let me go back to my list view. Um, boom, boom, boom. Oh, you know, one other thing, too, that you could do, like we did with the interviews, um, we do have the metadata, metadata tagging on all the clips. But one thing, too, to sort of help us quickly find B-roll is we created this B-roll sequence. Let me kind of show you how that looks. So this is kind of cool. So this is, you can see what we've done here is these are all the B-roll clips. 
And what we've done is we've broken them out into tracks. Right. So we've got 5G, uh, Snapdragon, entertainment, medical, wearables, audio. And this was another way to quickly visually sort of scan through clips. If we didn't want to have to search, you know, for whatever reason, um, we just needed to quickly look through things. We built this timeline out so that we could just sort of say, okay, I need networking clips, clips that revolve around networking technology. And boom, we could just go to this particular video track. Um, let's go back here and you can see. So these are all clips that are deal with technology from networking. And then the next one would be IoT, which is Internet of Things. And so we have all this B-roll that goes along with that. So again, it's finding ways to sort of speed up the workflow, um, thinking, you know, how can I find this clip really quick? What do I need to, you know, to create to, to make me edit faster? And this was another tool that we relied on pretty heavily. So, um, so I like that was really helpful. Uh, let's see, what cameras did you use for this shoot? We used uh, a Sony FS700. Um, we used two Canon C100s. Um, and we also got some footage from uh, GoPro. So we had a little GoPro mounted on a little, like, uh, I forget what the, not the Karma, but oh, Karma's uh, the drone. But what's the little gimbal thing they have for actually, it? Actually, I think it, they're, I think it's the same. Is it? I forget what they call it. Whatever yeah, it's, it is. It's, it's the electronic gimbal where, it, like, if yeah. you do this, it stays yeah. steady for so you. So we had a GoPro, and we, the GoPro was just for, like, we wanted to have, like, tracking shots through the booth, and we just wanted to get quick shots, and we used a couple of those. And I think we, in years past, we used uh, uh, GoPros for time-lapse shots, too. Yeah, and we just I mount them that. up yeah. in somewhere in the booth and then just walk away and come back, so... Um, but yeah, and is it, is it hard for you? I mean, because you're not doing, again, you're not doing a ton of um, color work, so... Matching those cameras is that a is that something you worry about a lot or is it yes yes um, so I will tell you having shot with those that configuration before the Canons and the Sony's the Canon and the Sony's look at colors different yeah um, and we've learned the hard way that there are certain colors that Canon not to not Canon love you guys um, <laughs> but they there's I, I actually we did a shoot one time and we were shooting something and. It was, I think it was like kind of a, a teal color, mm -hmm. and the it, we the, the monitor the colors didn't match, and the camera we didn't have any color settings. It was all just sort of you know stock, and it was shooting log, and we were amazed at the, how the Canon didn't get the color representation right between huh. the two, and everything else matched. We took my we took the FS seven hundred, we put it up, it looked perfect, but right. for whatever reason Sony or uh, Canon just saw that color a little different, so. And we've seen that happen in the past. That's why using the chart is right. vital, because it really helps us dial in everything and get it just right, so we can see that the colors are all lined up. Because yeah, we've had issues with the, the Sony and the Canon not matching and not getting the colors right, and having to use the secondary color correction tools to go in and really sort of fix little things right. in one of the cameras. And you know, not to knock Canon, but Sony was usually getting it right, Canon wasn't. And so I would have to go in and dial in. I remember it was a uh, one particular project we did. The guy had a purple shirt on, uh -huh. and the purple didn't match between the two cameras. And I just about went nuts trying well, to because that's that's probably like a big part of your frame, and it's a yeah. kind of color that yeah, you it's miss like you're easily. cutting back and forth yeah. in you know a close up and a wide shot. Yeah. And so yeah, I ended up just using a secondary tool inside Premiere, using the Lumetri, and just picked that color. Was able to dial it in to match it, and yeah, it worked. Great. You know, but it was extra, you know, yeah, the Lumetri tool saved me at that point using the secondary, but yeah, it's that kind of stuff. So yeah, if you're shooting with, I always recommend shooting with two cameras, uh, two separate brands, that's not a bad thing, but you need to make sure that you've got right. your colors dialed in if you're not shooting with a chart. Otherwise, always, always shoot with a chart. So Great. There you go. Tips um, and tricks. I don't know Canon. I love them. I love them too. They make the the pictures out of Canon stuff is are, is beautiful, and I would never knock them. Um, I just happen to be more of a Sony guy, and so um, I have the the shooters that I work with who shoot with Canon are just diehard Canon oh, yeah, folks, yeah. and I like to rib them, and they rib me equally about Sony. So you know, um, how did you get to see illustration? Oh, maybe that's not for us. <laughs> um, let's see. I think there's any more questions here. All right. Okay. Are we getting some entries? We're getting some entries. Awesome. Keep it up. We'll be uh, 
Or are those looking the entries? At these? Yeah, these are the entries for the challenge. Um, so awesome. And I, you know, I I never criticize anybody else's color correction because I'm terrible at it. So Patrick can can you know verify that he's seen me give a demo with color. So <laughs> <laughs> color correction is definitely an art form. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that if you, you know, I I I've, I've gotten to the point now where it's like if I can find somebody um, who, you know, if the project is really high priority and it's got a budget. I'll find somebody who can, you know, edit or who can do who's a colorist and have them do the color work. Um, it really makes a huge difference. I think, yeah, you yeah. know, they have tools and they know how to do stuff. That yeah, no, it's it's true. I mean, I think um, what I do like is that I mean, this is one of the reasons that I actually, even being somebody that you know is supposed to say this, it's actually true. I was really excited about the color match features and some of the color things you've shown because. Because I'm bad at it, like it's nice to have something that like will get it close for me. Yeah. If not, if even if it's not dead on, if it just gets it close enough for me to like do just the final little edits, that I can do. It's yeah. when I'm left with a blank canvas of these two things, fix the color, that's when it's like, okay, like which dial do I start with? So I actually am learning just watching you working with the the you know RGB parade. I'm yeah. like, oh, that's how you use that thing. Awesome. Um, <laughs> Patrick says you're way better than you pretend right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, Patrick, you're supposed to go with it. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing I will say about the color match, just you know, and I'm just now starting to to play with it and and getting uh, good results. Um, but the thing that I learned right right away with you know somebody as somebody who shoots a lot of log. Um, I thought I would be like, like, oh, let's test it out and just let's try to match up like a log clip that's ungraded against a clip that's graded mm -hmm. and see if I can pull that off. Yeah, that does not work. Um, or at least it didn't work for me. So if you do shoot log, um, what you need to do is sort of grade your image just to get it, you know, looking decent. You know, um, you know, pull up, you know, add some contrast. You know, add some saturation if you need to. Just sort of get it clean, a good clean basic look, and then use the color match. And that's when it really kind of comes into play mm -hmm. and, and it really starts to work good. Um, you know, lo again, log footage takes some extra work involved. Right. So if you are go out and shoot log today and then drop it in, I want it to match this beautiful stock shot that I've got, and it doesn't work, yeah, that's, that's kind of, you know, don't be surprised. You, you've got to do a little bit of w more work with log to get it looking good, so. Um, I thought I saw another question in here. Just curious, when you're shooting run and gun style with FS7 and C100, what format do you shoot in and how do you handle media storage? Ah, good question. Um, it's actually we're shooting with an FS700, not an FS7, um, but we do shoot sometimes with an FS7. Um, we shoot, it depends. Um, for this particular project, everything was shot in HD, just on the H, H or SDHC card. Um, but we have shot, when we shoot with the FS7, for some running gun stuff, we have shot in uh, the 4K format. Right. Um, so we have done that. Uh, the uh, I think the other part of the question was media storage. Everything is backed up onto hard drives, um, external hard drives, and then an internal hard drive. So if we're editing out in the field, everything will go onto two external hard drives, and then I usually will try to put one copy on the internal hard drive on this particular laptop. Um, if we're going to be editing back at our studio, at our office, um, everything lives on our system drive. Um, we have a, uh, an HP uh, Z8 workstation with, I think, about 20 terabytes worth of storage. Is that all? That's it. <laughs> and uh, you, that, you that's need to up that a little bit. <laughs> that's <friend>. internal. <laughs> and then um, and then we have external drives too. Oh, um, that's great. Yeah. So yeah, so everything. Everything lives in two places at all times. Right, um, no, that's very important. Yes, um, for for a number of reasons. One of which, which is kind of random, and, and not a lot of people know this. And this was some a conversation I actually, of all people, I had with my insurance agent. He asked me once. He goes, "So if your office burned down, you know, what would happen to the footage that you shot for your clients?" And I said, uh, "Well, you know, I always have it backed up." And so to me, he goes, "Well, where did the backups live?" Right. I go, well, the, uh, the backups live in my backpack usually. He goes, okay, good. So you take them home with you every night. And I said, yeah. He goes, okay, good. Right. So it's good to have backups that live in two in different, different places. places. If yeah. you work from home, this isn't so much of an issue. Although I know guys who work from home and they have like a fireproof safe that they actually oh, wow. store their hard drives in. Right. Um, 
But uh, but yeah, if you do work in an office, it's good to have sort of a redundancy. If, if you're able to take footage on a portable drive with you out of the office, just in case something happens, that's not a bad thing. Um, there, I think there's a question about lentils, but I'm assuming that was lenses, Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So for the so for this particular shoot, we threw on the Canon uh, 24 to 105 lenses on both cameras. Um, and we did that just because we wanted to have a, a bit of a zoom. I did shoot a couple of the interviews uh, with a 50 millimeter lens. Um, I have a set of Rokinon Cine DS lenses. Um, and so um, if it was just, uh, if we were setting up for an interview and it was kind of in a darker part of the booth, um, the, the 24 to 105 is really, is not that fast of a lens. It's, I think it's an F4, whereas the Rokinon 50 is a 1.5. So that's pretty fast, and so um, I would throw that lens on if, if we didn't if we needed the extra light. Um, so yeah, both lenses are, are really good though. The twenty four to one hundred five gave us a lot of freedom to shoot, and I think we had a seventy to two hundred millimeter in there as well. But I don't know that we ever really used mm -hmm. it. So, um, let's see if there's any other questions here. Uh, is there any third party plugins you use in your workflow? Um, yes, actually there are. Um, my, probably my favorite third-party plugin um, are all the tools from Red Giant. Um, Colorista, Looks, um, Universe for transitions. Um, you know, have just yeah, they have a whole host of stuff. Red Giant um, is probably like transition-wise and, and plugin-wise, um, probably my go-to go-to place. Um, there's another company out there that's kind of a smaller company that makes some really cool plugins um, called New Blue Effects, and I'm mm -hmm. kind of partial to them because they're from SD, they're from San Diego, where I'm from, and so I always try to give them a shout out. They make some. Oops, I'm gonna get my screen back here. Um, they make a, 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 pro, a color correction pro, program called ColorFast. Um, I actually don't have it installed on the system right now, but I have it back in the office, and it's it's a pretty handy color correction tool as well. Mm -hmm. um, it does some really interesting stuff, and so. But Red Giant is probably my big one. Um, somebody says well, they wish Red Giant wasn't so expensive. Yeah, sorry, I don't, I can't set the prices on that. Talk to talk to the folks over there. But if you can afford it, it it's totally worth it. Um, they they make some really good stuff. Um, ever make any LUTs with Adobe Capture? That's a um, oh yeah mobile yeah. You know what? I've actually done that once or twice. Oh really? Yeah. yeah. Um, I haven't done it recently, but yeah, I have Man, done that. I shouldn't have sounded so surprised. I mean, that's that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> no, I, I remember when that first came out. Um, I, I actually did use that for a couple things, and it and it's a really interesting system. I haven't done it lately, right. um, but but yeah, I'd be curious to know if a lot of people are doing that, you know, because it's it's a really cool. It's a cool yeah. I mean, it actually is. It's um. When you see like a color palette you like, you know, yeah. like I've done, I actually, when it first came out, I used it as well, and I would see like a sunset that was just had like these purples and oranges, and I was just like, oh wow, that's really cool. And you can just kind of capture that color palette and turn it into a LUT, which was pretty, pretty yeah. awesome, yeah. Yeah, the a lot of the, you know, the, the Adobe mobile apps um, seem to, I mean, I, I don't know, maybe they get more play. I, I, I don't hear that many people talking about them, and there's some really cool stuff there. I, I've started using Premiere Clip a okay, lot more. Yeah. Um, you know, and a part of that's because I have kids. Right. Yeah. So <laughs> that's great for that. Yeah. You know. Yeah. It's uh, it's 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 a great tool to cut together to send to family and stuff like that. And I, and I've actually started using it um, sometimes on shoots. I'll do like when we go out on location scout, we'll use it right. to sort of shoot with my phone, and I can build something real quick just to sort of see how this is all going to work and angles and things like that. So. Right. Um, but yeah, Premiere Clip's a handy little feature. Um, did we use lights for this shoot? No, we did not. Um, for this particular project, we did not use. We used just available light. We, because it was so run and gun, we didn't have, and the budget was tight. Right. Um, we didn't have any extra hands to carry anything. Right. Um, well, I take that back. We did have a camera mounted light, a little LED light that we put on the camera, um, but that was it. We mm -hmm. would just, you know, and we would just dial that in, um, you know, for either tungsten or daylight, depending on where what we thought the lights were. Um, but yeah, that was it. No lights. I wish we could. I think one year we tried to actually lug lights around and it was a disaster. So we never tried that again. Um, let's see, Clip is super awesome for creative social media content too. Yeah, yeah, I bet it would be. Yeah. And Kevin says to shoot in DNG. <laughs> I actually st I actually have a project that I did shoot in Cinema DNG. Um, it's, it's a great format. It it's takes it's up heavy though. It's heavy. It's heavy, yeah. It's heavy. Um, 
you know, in fact, yeah, I could probably show that um, a little bit. But you know what? We've got a little bit of time. Let me close this. Just because Kevin Monaghan brought that up. <laughs> Troublemaker. Uh, let me save this. <laughs> um, let me see if I can open this up real quick. So talking about like testing workflows. So raw, for those of you who don't know Cinema DNG, it's a raw format and it's a great format. Uh, let me see, open project here. Let's go to my Thunderbolt drive. Let's open up. Let's see, uh, Sisse Tazera says uh, you can make LUTs for videos in Photoshop. That's true, you can. Um, Kevin Monaghan, Lightroom iPhone. Lightroom on iPhone is amazing. I use that every day. <laughs> um, and it does shoot DNG. I guess I, maybe he, that's part of what you were saying, but that's, yeah. it was he meant DNG and stills in Lightroom, but he's right. like, right on. So, so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to take that one step further because we're talking video. <laughs> yeah. So, so I was thinking about moving over to a raw workflow. Um, and so I went out and shot a bunch of stuff. This is all shot raw, um, Cinema DNG. And for those of you who've never shot raw, it's a very, it's it's awesome, but it the files are huge. Um, but the one nice thing it gives you is you have if you come up to so this this clip right here. Um, let's come up here. So if in my master effects, if I click on this, you can see Cinema DNG source settings. So I've got temperature, I've got tint and exposure. So this works beyond whatever color correction I put on it. So if I um, if I turn this off, you can see the color the shot's a little underexposed. Um, you know, and, and the color temperature is a little different, it's a little bit more blue. Um, but if I turn what I did back on, you see it's a little bit brighter. Um, so oh, I guess I didn't move the color, the temperature on that. But I can totally adjust the the white balance on this if I need to. And just by dialing this in, I can totally adjust the exposure. And this is all outside of Lumetri. This is just within the clip itself. And so I'm going to re undo what I did and get it back to normal here. Thank you. And you can see I've got tint as well, so I can play with the tint on this clip. And that's really nice as well, so I'm going to redo that. Um, but you can see, if I try to play this, this clip back, so I've got, watch this little green thing right here. That's my frame playback indicator. It's, let's see how far we get before it turns yellow. So right there, so now we're starting to drop frames. So raw is super intensive, um, you know, to play back. But as a format to, to acquire your footage in, it works really, really good. Um, I see somebody saying ProRes is more than enough for commercial and short work. That is true. ProRes uh, is most of the time what we normally shoot in. Mm -hmm. uh, we record out to Ultra HD ProRes files and work with that. But the the you know having the ability to edit or to you know the color correction opportunities with raw and the quality of it is really really nice but you do need to have a proxy workflow with that um, and so this little test project we did um, I actually did proxies um, and you can see if I turn this on this should play back fine now because we're playing off the proxy files let me go full res here. And proxies is something we're going to cover tomorrow? Uh, we'll Thursday? probably talk about that on Thursday. On Thursday. On Thursday. Right. But yeah, we'll talk a little bit about it now. But yeah, so all of the Cinema DNG files were all converted into proxy files. That allowed us to do the edit. Um, and then once we got into color grading, then it was a matter of turning off the proxies, looking at the original, and then doing a color grade. And you can see that um, I did add a little Lumetri on here. We shot these all sort of raw and log. And so just kind of. But this is mostly just a test project, just to see how does what's the workflow like? Right. Yeah, are, can we even handle raw on our system? And yeah, if you're working with raw, you pretty much have to go proxy, I think. Um, yeah, it's it's pretty heavy. It's a, I mean, it's a great creative tool. It's really for when you are. I think somebody was saying um, it's mostly for long form or feature length. Yeah. To say Tazera, yeah. So I, I agree with that. Although I I would also say like it's also about like how if it's if this is a piece that's like your art piece, you know, like yeah. raw is really great because you just have so much ability to dial in, you know, you just have so much latitude in what you can do with the highlights and the shadows and the, the blacks and the color. It just gives you a lot of creative license. Yeah. Um, but it gives you a lot of creative license, so you have to be ready to You have dig to put in, in the work. It. Yeah, you got to put in work with it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for the guests, how do you know when to stop color correcting? 
<laughs> that is an awesome question. That is an awesome question. You can say the same about editing. It, when yeah, you know no, when to stop sure. editing. I mean, I usually say when the when the client finally just agrees and says that's it, and we just sort of abandon the project. You know, um, you know, but but no, when I think it's when you stop color correcting, it's really sort of when you feel like you've got it right. You know, you know the emotion that you're looking for for that shot yeah. um, or for that scene. And you know when you feel that you've got it, that's when that's when you move on. Um, and listen, that's not to say that you won't, you know, finish it one day and then the next day come back and look at it and think that's still not right, and go in and dial it in. I do that with editing all the time. Um, I when I edit, I usually reach a point where it's like, okay, I've I've kind of hit my threshold. I'm I'm not I'm looking now just to sort of get done and not be creative. And that's when I, I shut down for the day. Right. And then, um, and then so yeah, that, I'll come back the next day when I'm more fresh and keep working. But yeah, you'll know, you know when, when something's right, when it's, you'll just look at it and think, that's perfect. That's exactly the emotion, that's exactly the look I wanted. Um, you know, yeah, so it, it's just a personal thing, so. Do you ever, um, this, is a, this is something I like, how uh, I do every now and again, I'll go back and look at old edits of mine and that's like, dangerous. By I, ha- I actually had to stop doing it because I like I would be like, I can't believe I did that. This is this is terrible. Whereas when I like did it, I was like, okay, no, this works. It fits. You know, like do you? Yeah. So, you know, it's funny. I actually went back and looked at um, some stuff I did. I don't know how many years ago. It was some of the first like paid work that I did on my own. And I honestly watched it and thought, I can't believe someone paid me to make this. Right. You know, and I can't believe they continued to hire me, you know, based on this. But, but at the same time, I think that that's good. Right. I think going back and looking at your old work, and seeing the improvement in it, it shows that you've grown, right. and that you've improved, and that you're better, and that you're you're bettering your skills. If you go back and look at something you did ten years ago, now that's not, you know, you should. If you go back and look at something you did ten years ago and think yeah, I'm just as good now as I was then. You know, that, then whatever you did ten years ago may be may have stood the test of time. But go back and look at more of what you did. Right. And I guarantee you, back there, you're, there's going to be stuff that you're a little bit embarrassed about. That like, oh man, I can't believe, I can't believe I used that transition. Right. I can't believe I did that cut. Or listen, to how bad that audio sounds. Right. Right. You know, it's just going to be those things. And and I think that that's completely good. I think that's a that. great perspective on it. Like if if you look back and you're feeling that, then that means great. You've moved. You've grown in your skill set. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Um, I like I know. <laughs> Bruce's comment when you're out of budget. Yes, that is the real answer. Yes, <laughs> when you tell the client we only got this much budget and you hit that mark, that's usually when we pull the plug. Um, what is the best way to calibrate monitor colors when working with others? Oh, that's a good question. Um, there are a lot of calibration tools that are out there. I know X Right has a color calibration tool. I believe there's one uh, called a Spider. I think. Yes. Yeah. The Spider does one. Um, I would say that that is really key. If you're going to be doing dedic- like really hardcore color correction work, you want to calibrate that monitor. Um, I know for the longest time, before I t- had calibrated monitors, uh, I remember the project specifically where I knew something was wrong. I had a lower third up on, on my program monitor that was orange, uh-huh. and the confidence, the, the monitor I have in my edit bay, the orange was a different color. It was a different shade of orange. I remember thinking, okay, what's right? Right. I wasn't sure, and it was the brand's, it was the company's orange. I had to get that right. So I went in and made sure that it was, you know, I used the 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 one of the values from Photoshop, um, you know, for the color when you select the color and you've got color the color picker, the, 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 you mean the, RG, the um, RGB or yeah, yeah. I can't think of what it is right now, but like yeah, when you have the little code that you whatever. Oh, this, the hex code. For the hex the, code. For the color right. That's yeah. it. So I had the hex code from the company, from their brand book, so I knew that I was using the right color. But it was odd that in the video monitors it was different, and so having that calibrated monitor fixes a lot of that, and and so you'll know what you're seeing is what you're outputting. Right. So, um, let's see, there's so much specific person who's nice to work with and is passionate about the work. Uh, okay, I guess there's no, uh, oh, feel for, oh, no other questions right now, okay, good. So do, do um, we need to do that? We actually now? we actually need to view them a little bit. So okay. I've, I've been kind of playing them a little bit as as we went through. So let's see here. I can start with because uh, I don't think you've gotten to see these. I haven't seen them yet. So yeah, let's uh, let's uh, let's take a quick look. <coughs> Does everybody? Oh, everybody's seeing this. Okay. Yeah, and no, everybody's. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I like this with the wow. transitions. Yeah. 
Nice. St style points for sure there. Yeah. Hafid. Yeah. That's a. Uh... Nice work. Yeah, nice. Let's take a look. Uh, what kind of computers are you using? Oh, um, I edit. I'm a Windows guy. Um, I don't use Mac. We have a Mac at the office, but we have it strictly for ProRes encoding. Um, but so this is a Dell uh, 7710 workstation class laptop, and then uh, we've got HPs at the office. Uh, HP Z workstations. So that's yeah. I'm a Windows guy. Love Windows. All right, let's see, Raymondas. Let's see. Ooh, that was cool. By the, uh, nice. Nice cold tones there. I think that's what I'm seeing. Nice. Very nice. Uh, what GPU do you use for editing color grading? Um, the GPU I have in here, I believe, uh, is an NVIDIA, I think it's an M3000 maybe? 3000? And, and then in the, I have an, uh, G, uh, the 5000, I think, in mm, okay. the workstation at the office. So yeah, all NVIDIA. So. All right, let's see. Ibrahim. That looks nice too. They all look good. Yeah, no, this is. <laughs> thanks all right, for, this is, thanks this for is making our really job hard. <laughs> I have a question. So, are the graphics something that they were those included? Were were those, the yeah, were the graphics included, included or did they build those? They added so, so that. You, you went and got your own motion graphic templates for this. Wow. Somebody's trying to score brownie points that by adding that. some cool graphics. That is, I already do this one. That was Ibrahim. All right, nice, nice use of. Uh, the motion graphics there. Uh oh. There we go. Move that arrow. Oh, then we yeah, had a nice little lower third yeah. pop up there. Nice. All right. Looks good. I was actually in your. I tried to go to Yosemite for the. Um, Every February, there's a fire. There's a, the a waterfall that the sunset hits just right. It mm -hmm. turns it into like a firefall. It looks like oh, wow. fire or lava coming off the. But there wasn't enough rain this year, so it didn't happen. <laughs> um, all right, here, Tim. Oh, oh no, I did that one already. Okay, I actually do like the color on this one. I have to say, there's something. Yeah. It's subtle, but it's it's nice. It kind of gives it a dreamy feel mm -hmm. without overdoing it. That's kind of yeah. nice. All right, in that case, that's so funny using someone else's computer. The <laughs> scroll is the wrong way. I keep. Uh, all right, I nod. Um, that looks good too. Yeah, that's nice. Kind of warmer. Mm-hmm. A little more saturated too. It seems yeah. Like. Nice, you. Wow, you know it's interesting because it, it really is about the feel, right? It's not. It's not like yeah. there's anyone that's better. It's just yeah. kind of like it's, what it's evokes all, yep. kind of reaction or an emotion from you. Yep, the, I agree. Um, I'm doing a terrible job of knowing which ones I've hit already. Did I just do this <laughs> one? I think I just did this one, didn't I? I don't think you did. Oh, okay, because there was a lower third down there. I don't remember. Oh, Forest Hill. Okay, yeah. David Yatman. All right, let's see. Nice little lower third. Going for the. Greenish to yellow tint. Yeah, it's really, it's about what fill is it? Because any one of these could work in depending on what piece they were in, right? Right, yeah, exactly. Okay, one more. Hopefully we're not, oh wait, is this? Oh yeah, this is real, okay. And this looks like it's gonna be a, like a very clean. Mm -hmm. Kind of going for the natural colors of it. All right. I th somebody had mentioned something about refreshing, and there might be one more. Oh, okay. I'll do a refresh. Yeah, there'll be more. We'll, we'll give them like another two minutes. Another two okay. minutes. Okay, we've got another two minutes for the. Uh... Oh, see, <laughs> it's going to get overwhelming. Any minute, we're going to be like, okay, no, wait. <laughs> um, are there any more questions? Um, 
Uh, when you go through, Let's wait. Oh. Who's going to do an orange and teal? Oh, I think Kevin's talking to somebody in the, oh, okay. the chat booth. Uh, can you go through a secondaries workflow with masks and dialing in color? Yeah. Let me go. Let me get out of this Cinema DNG project. Uh, right, because you were talking about the purple shirt that didn't match, yeah. and now you pulled that. Yeah. Uh, let's see. No, I don't want to save this. Let me see. Let's go back to this one. Let's go. Let's find something. Something what would be good to do for that. Let's see. Let's let everything load up here. All right. Uh, let's see. Find something that might work good for that. Let's see. Bear with me here, folks. I'm just going to find something. Well, you know what? We could try with this. Let's see how this goes. Um, so what we'll do is we'll change this color on this backdrop on this sign. And I'm not quite sure how this is going to work, so let's see. Um, so let's grab Lumetri. Let's go over to our color setup here. Um, secondary. Um, so let's turn it on. Let's, oops. Grab my color picker here. Oops. Let's do this. Let me turn this off real quick. Let me select this color. So, so in the HSL secondary. So I'm going to change this background color here, and hopefully this stays consistent throughout the shot here. It does. Okay. So I'm going to tweak that color. So first thing I do is I come into my secondary, I choose that color, and you can see it it, it uses the, uh, the settings here to dial that in. Now if I come down to my color gray. And let's see, I usually like to use this, the color black. So I'm going to add in. Now, the problem is with this one is that it's an LED sign, so it's going to be kind of wonky, but oh, it's actually it's working pretty good. So what I'm doing is I'm adding the, I'm using the plus eyedropper to dial in that color more. Um, and I want to get rid of this stuff up here. So now I'm using the plus, the minus one, and I'm going to just try to just get that sign focused in on. Um, let's come over here. Let's, let's look like there's some spill down there. Oops. Let's undo that. And I could probably draw a mask around that, but let's see how we do with this. So I've got that color isolated now. I'm going to blur it a little bit just to... And then let's start dragging it. Let's go back to our... Uh, let's turn off this. So now if I start dragging this, you can see I'm able to change that color. So now I've made it pink. So before we had the sort of teal color, I guess. Would that be teal? Yeah, I call it teal. Yeah. And now we've made it pink. So that's the secondary in a quick nutshell. Wow, I can't believe that worked. That, that was worked a little perfectly. Nervous. <laughs> I was a little nervous that I, would work. It's like you set that up ahead of time or something. <laughs> you sure? <laughs> yeah, so so that's secondary. So yeah, so uh, using the example that you mentioned with the shirt, that's what I basically had to do. I didn't, you know, have to mask anything off really because I'm able, I'm just isolating that particular color and saying everything that's this color, you know, change. Um, and it, so it works really well. Now you can see I'm getting a little bit of spill down in here in this corner. So maybe doing a mask would probably be a good thing here, just to mask off the sign so that you know we don't get anything else. But um, but yeah, that's how the, the secondary works. You know, in a nutshell, it works really well. Um, I the the improvements that they made to that, I think it was in the last version of Premiere. Where they improved that. Um, yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. they added it, and man, it works so much better. I remember I've been using Premiere long enough to remember. I remember what the old secondary controls were like. Right. Oof. <laughs> this is like good oh, job, Patrick. Good job, Pat yeah. Good Patrick. Good job, Patrick and the team. Yeah. Um, so let's see. Is there think there's any other questions? Nope, I don't think so. So do we need to go through more of these? To, yeah, there's a couple more here. Um, let's take a quick look. Did we do this one already? I'm not sure. I don't think so. Yeah. That one looks I different. It showed up when it. That looks kind of cool. That's definitely dreamy. That's like yeah. I like that one. It's, it feels a little fogged in this particular part, but yeah. the, the first scene looked really nice. Yeah. Nice job. 
And then this one. Oh, you went, oh, <laughs> I like that. Mike, Michael, yeah, nice. You got yourself in there. <laughs> doing the Vanna White on the creek. Nice. <coughs> nice. I, I was going to say that. I saw the name come up. I'm like, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see here. Oh, we got some graphics going uh, okay. here. All right, Paul, show us what you got. Quick wipe. Oh. Fancy. Fancy. That's that's a very clean, yeah, I but like that. Uh, it pops. That, yeah. That was nice on that uh, that second shot. So just so I know, did we just give him those? I'm assuming we just gave him those two shots, right? It's just these two okay. shots, yeah. I mean, obviously, that's what everybody's using. I just wanted to make sure there wasn't, like, some third shot that nobody was using. No, only Michael went went out and, yeah. and did his own <laughs> shot there. A little extra credit. Yeah, a little extra credit there. I think you get points for, like, adding yourself in for sure. I think that's. I think, I think that, that's that was all the new ones, yeah. Let me re do another refresh just in case. Yeah. So, yeah, no, really nice work, everyone, that's submitted so far. Are we, are we still taking entries at this point? No, I think we... Oh, okay, we, we can we can pick a winner. Oh man, lucky us! All right. Um, so I wrote down a couple of names. Let's see. I think if we do a quick. I think we'll just do a quick run through. Not even playing. I'm just kind of looking at the. Amanda. See, yeah, I remember that one. You you, you think like I remember, remember that, that one? one? Okay. Mm -hmm. right, let's try. Uh... Do I remember? I'm just gonna play this one just a little bit. I remember that one. Oh, it's the transitions one. Yeah. Okay. So style points for sure. Yep. I think uh, I think you're on my list. Arnaud. Yeah, I think this was the nice. Uh... Yeah. Yeah. I remember that one. Yeah. Um. All right, this one was nice, mm -hmm. Tim. Yep. Yeah, Tim, I really yeah. liked your. Actually, I liked your color work on this one. There was something that was a, uh, it was, it was evocative. I thought. Mm -hmm. I thought. Yeah, and, I agree. Uh, it wasn't. It wasn't going for the natural, but it. Uh, it was. It wasn't harsh. All right, let's see here. Ibrahim's. I liked yours as well. Yeah. Um, feel free to. <laughs> I, you know, so, I mean, you're, you're kind of driving this, so. Yeah, yeah, no, go see. for it. Yeah. Um, I mean, how do we, uh, let's see, I'll look at this one one more time. Yeah, it looks good, too. Definitely has its own feel. Yeah. And that's the, that's the. That's the hard part of it. So, so yeah, I don't know. I mean, how do we do? We do want to write down the names, or do we want to just yeah? If you have a, if you have a favorite, write down the name. I'll, I'll okay. hide it from the camera. Okay. <laughs> um, oh, crap! I didn't catch the names. Um, let me see here. Let me. Okay. There's that. We looked at that one. We looked at that one. We looked at that oh. one. Did we look at that one? No, no, I'm, I'm, I just don't know why I wasn't using the arrows to go through them. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Um, there's Tim. I remember that one. Okay. So I think it was... That one would be mine. Okay. If I'm getting the name spelled right. Okay. Well, cool. But, well, but you, you, you... That's no, my no, no. but you choose. You are the... <laughs> it's your fault. <laughs> <laughs> So let me just get the name. Let me see if I can run through and find the name. We're almost there, guys. Sorry. All right. So our winner is. Can we can we just announce this? Okay. That's what, no, you, you, you announce. Okay. It. No, I'm just saying that's the right one. Yes. Okay. That's it. it. Is going to be Arnaud. You can see it. Arnaud <laughs> L. Came. So sorry if I if I messed up your name, but um, welcome. Congratulations. Um, and our lucky winner gets a gets a Creative Cloud subscription. Well, wow. you guys should have been submitting. You get a Creative Cloud subscription. Um, By the way, they were so all they were really, all awesome. Yeah, yeah, they were all really good. Okay, so let's go ahead and I'm gonna. Can I do this thing? Uh, 
Here we go. No. Oh, you won't do. All right. We won't do live. We won't do, do full, screen? full screen. Yeah. I think we have to be actually on YouTube for it to do full screen for us. So, um, but here it is, the winning color grade. Um, so thanks everyone so much for um, for uh, participating. I'm gonna throw out. Uh, a shout out to Tim because I actually um, I think you get an honorable mention. I really liked your color grade too. Yes, actually, I, I liked everybody's, but just a quick. Uh, it was a tough decision. It was a tough decision, and then yeah, and then the transitions one was awesome, and then Michael for being in there like that. You just win, for, you know, <laughs> you get honorable mention for that. Um, all right, so thanks everyone. Yeah, that was great. Um, so our next bit is I guess we just keep going. We do you so, have yeah? Um, any other yeah, points can, you want to hit on? Uh, let's see. I can. Try to think up something here. So yeah, how much time do we have left? I just 25 minutes. Oh really? Okay. Wow. Ask us questions. <laughs> yeah, if, if, yeah, exactly. If anybody's got any questions. 15. Oh, 15 minutes. Okay. Yeah. Um I did see one question up. Somebody asked earlier about using uh, a third party app for color grading um, outside of Premiere. Um uh, I would say this in regards to doing that, that you can do that. Um you know, but you do, getting things outside of Premiere, um, you know, and sending it out, is, it just sort of adds another layer of complexity to your workflow. I mean, you've yeah. got the tools inside of there now to do a lot of really good work. So, I mean, you know, I would say if you can try to keep as much inside Premiere as you can, that would be good. But you know, if you need to send out to something, then that that is another option that yeah. you have. Um, you know, but I think Lumetri's come a really long way, and so I would. I would say try to do as much as you can with that, and if you you hit a wall, then that might be something you can explore. So yeah, no, I mean I think it it depends on your project, right, and what absolutely what you're going for, and what's I mean, you know, we we put everything in there that we can so that you can stay and be as efficient as possible and um, self sufficient as possible. But there's always going to be you know a need to go out and do you know depending on the project, there there could easily be a reason to go out outside of Premiere and get color work done, it makes complete sense, so, yep. yeah. Yep, I agree. Um, let's see, I'm trying to think about what else I could show here. Um, but uh, let's see, so I talked about, let me go back to my edit workspace here. Um, okay, let's see, so yeah, I talked about the B-roll timeline that we built, you know, um, talked about, you know, all that stuff, the interviews. Um, Let's see, I'm trying to think about what else we can talk about here. I don't know, I'm kind of, I kind of covered it all that I had on my list here. So, I mean, is there any, I guess my question would be to, to you out there, is there things that you have questions about with Premiere that you are kind of interested in or any of the, the anything with the new features or anything like that? So. Right, yeah, so I mean, I think the new features we covered were um, uh, the auto ducking right. for audio. Um, the uh, improved essential graphics panel, the ability to find, which you all did amazingly with these pieces, you know, being able to go out and find uh, templates to use for uh, titles and graphics within the video. Um, and then the split screen. Mm -hmm. And did we sh actually show color match at all? Um, we didn't, I was gonna try that. Is that for, for tomorrow? For, yeah. Oh, okay, tomorrow I don't wanna steal your time. stuff for tomorrow, okay. Yeah. All right, so yeah, so like, um, but showing the split screen, which is new in this, uh, this latest release, so, um, those are all the, the the new features that we announced at our last NAB with the latest release. And one thing I didn't show is the ability to to open um, project Premiere projects in Audition, but I was going to try to show that on yeah, another sure. day. So, um, so we do have yeah yeah. So uh, where did you learn your skills? So I actually went to film school. Um, I went to San Diego State University film program. Um, go Aztecs, and uh, and. But you know, while I was there, I didn't really. I did some editing, um, but I didn't really. I didn't consider myself an editor at that point. It wasn't until I got outside of school um, that I really started picking up editing, uh, because it was a good way to get paid. Um, and and actually, I'll give credit to. There's a guy that I used to work with whose name I don't. He's. I know he's probably not watching this. Um, his name's AJ Von Wolf. Uh -huh. kind, of, kind of cool name. That it's guy's awesome name. It is an awesome <laughs> name. You you saw the guy too. He looks like he's got long hair and he's he's from he's from Boston, so he's got an accent. He's right. just super cool. But he was a phenomenal editor. I I got a chance to direct some TV commercials right out of film school, and he did the editing on those spots. 
And I remember sitting, and he worked at the same production house that I was working at, and I would sit in with him and talk to him about editing and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I learned a lot from him on wow, awesome. how to cut and things like that. And um, he does a lot of stuff. Funny enough, this is for Qualcomm. He does a lot of stuff for their competitor, <laughs> Intel. Oh. <laughs> um, but he, he, I learned a lot from him. But I mean, um, just working with a lot of other editors um, and and going to a lot of industry events and talking to other editors, I've picked up a lot from them. So and just by doing it, I right. think that's the most important. The, the way you learn editing the most is by sitting down and doing it. It doesn't matter if you go out in your backyard and shoot, you know, just the flowers in your backyard. Make a story out of it. Mm -hmm. You know, see if you can tell a compelling story. Uh, I remember years ago, um, there's a guy out of England, uh, some people might know, Philip Bloom, who does yeah. a lot of, Phil, he, he doesn't do him so much anymore, but for a while there, I used to call him like visual poems. He would just create, right. he would do camera tests, but he would shoot the most beautiful stuff with these cameras and just put it to music, whatever, and I would just pour over those and study his, his shooting, his composition, and his editing, and how, and so, yeah, just go out there and shoot stuff and edit it. It doesn't need, if, even if you don't have anybody to, a, a film project you're working on, doesn't matter. Right. Just, Just go out creative. and be yeah. creative. Yeah. Post it, and you learn how to edit more that way, um, and you'll learn how to tell a story. You know, I mean, silent filmmakers didn't have words; right. they just had images. And so, use those images to tell a story. There's a corporate client I used to work for, and he asked me one day to. He said, "I need you to go shoot um, a, a turbine engine being put together." And, and we need to make a video of that. And I said, are you uh, serious? Like, how am I, how, how do I shoot this? Right. Well, how do you make that interesting? And he said, go tell a story. Right. And so I took it in the back of my head. I'm like, okay, I'll make this a story. And did the shoot, did the edit. And I learned a ton right. from just that, looking at it from a like storytelling point of view. So, um, so that's it. Do I nest often? You know what? I don't usually, I don't use a lot of nests. Um, the only time I really nest anything is if it's graphics um, and I've got a, uh, you know, I've got like multiple graphic layers and I've got a, a lot of animation, then I'll build a nest for that. Um, the only other time I really nest is if I'm gonna use, it's sort of a workaround for warp, warp stabilizer. Yes. Because if I'm working in a 1080 timeline, I've got 4K footage, you can't warp stabilize that. And so I'll put that in a, in a sequence stabilize it and then nest it into my main sequence. Right, so to clarify, um, what it is is that you um, you can't warp stabilize in a sequence that doesn't match the clip um, pro properties, <coughs> so resolution and frame rate. So you have to put a clip in a native sequence, stabilize it, and then you take that sequence and nest it into the, like if it's a 4K clip, you take that 4K stabilized sequence and you nest it into your 1080 mm -hmm. sequence, and then you can treat it like a clip in that sequence. Just yeah. to just in case people didn't catch yeah. why yep. you can't. Yeah. Yep, that's it. Um, <laughs> some of these are great. Um, so there was a. I, I, yes, I nest often, and especially in the spring. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, somebody, I saw there was a, something about, uh, did I show how to make Mogerts? Um, I did not because that, I don't do, I don't make Mogerts. Um, I will tell you that I'm not, I have a graphics guy um, who does most of my graphics for me, um, DJ Summit, um, who is amazing. And Wait, is that his name? His name's DJ Summit, yeah. DJ Summit. Yeah. Wait, like, where do you meet these people with these names? I don't know, man. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, I, that's, <laughs> that's amazing. He does awesome right. work, and uh, and he does he does most of that stuff for me. So I I don't I don't know that I could show you how to make a mogurt just because. I think we have an idea for a new Adobe Live. Yeah. We need to get a <laughs> somebody out a mogurt expert. A mogurt expert in here. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, let's see. There's any other questions here? How often do you rebuild oh, every spring? I saw that one. Um, yeah, I don't think there's any other questions in there. I think I think people are getting, they're talking about the nesting and then the... Uh, <laughs> 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 um, so yeah, I'm just trying to think like, what else? So we've got what, like five more minutes? About like six. Yeah. Six? All right. Let's see, let's see if I can show anything else here. Um, let's see. I wish I could show you the completed video here, but I I can't just because of uh, a wonderful thing called NDA, which if anybody who does corporate work realizes NDA means non-disclosure agreement, and that means the company says, you know, I, they were gracious enough to let me use it as an example, but mm -hmm. they um, they said, you're not going to play the whole video start to finish, right? I'm like, no, no. No, of course not. not. No, of course not. Never. No. 
But um, but yeah, it could just show all the B-roll. So um, I'm trying to think of what else I could show here. We've, we've shown color correction. I don't know. I'm kind of... Uh, oh, somebody... Uh, yeah, there is somebody that did a thing about Mogrits. So... <laughs> yeah, me. I was going to say, there probably actually are videos on... Um, uh, Adobe.com, um, but if you do a search on on Premiere Mogurts or After Effects motion graphics, um, actually also in um, uh, do we have? Uh, can you go to the learning tab here? Let's just see if there's one if there's a video in there on. And I'm gonna have I'm yet another suggestion for something for learning. <laughs> so. Um, that's something I'll suggest that they put in for the learning tab here. Um, this is a great resource for people that are getting started. Um, and um, it's going to be continually continually updated and growing. So it sounds like Mogurts would be a great thing to put in there. Um, but yeah, if you go to adobe.com or do a search on After Effects motion graphics, you'll find, I'm sure, plenty of videos by both us and users. <laughs> Um, let's see. Let me get out of the learning tab here. I will say, you know, one thing, we're, I'm bouncing back and forth between the workspaces. Um, I'd be curious to know how many people develop their own custom workspaces or if they just use the ones that oh, yeah. come, you know, I have my own custom workspaces. Um, I mean, the color and the audio um, and the graphics, you know, is the Adobe stock one, but I have my own workspace that I use all the time. Um, and I'm curious to know how many other people have them. Um, yeah, so I'm just reading this. I'm overwhelmed with it. Trying to get client. Yeah, I've had clients come back after green and tell me not to. <laughs> yes, uh, Caitlin, that that's actually happened to me before. I actually had a client who agreed to let me post my work online um, on my company Vimeo channel, um, uh, and I posted it up. And literally within five minutes of posting it. Probably about ten minutes, I should say, ten minutes with the posting it. I got a call from their, um, not the legal department, but from like somebody in that arena, right? And they said, "Who gave you permission to post that video?" And I said, "Oh, so and so did." He goes, "Okay, thanks." They hung up on me, and then about fifteen minutes later, I got a call from the person who had authorized. And says, "Yeah, so you can post it, but you need to pull our logo off." They like I had to make changes, for right? It. Right. Um, and yeah, the big lesson I learned from that was that um, I didn't realize I used the company name in the Vimeo posting. And be, I guess you know companies have things yeah. set up so as soon as somebody posts something about their video, boom, it pops up a notification. And so they got that notification. And um, yeah, I was amazed. It's sort of Big Brother esque, right, you know. Right. It's like you just type it out there and wham. You know? Yeah, but it's uh, probably important to like also like know make sure the person that's giving you permission to do something is the person that has. The ultimate authority. The, the to do authority that. to give you that permission. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Getting permission. I mean, for those of you who, if you work in the corporate world or you're starting to do corporate video, that is a huge thing to make sure that you have that permission. Um, you know, a lot of times companies don't have an issue with you posting the work, even if they post it on their personal or their company web or uh, YouTube channel. That doesn't always necessarily mean you have permission right. to post it on your YouTube channel. So, you know, uh, better to ask and and get permission. So. Um, somebody says, I find it easier to work in my own space so I don't use the defaults. I'm with you. Um, I don't use, I like to develop my own kind of custom workspace and, and have that. Um, the, with the exception of, the, like I said, the color and the, the graphics and the audio, I, I like the way that's set up. But I like to have my own kind of, I like to know where everything is and put it where I, you know, again, it's, I have authority <laughs> issues, so it's like, uh -huh. I just want my own space. <laughs> so. So you don't uh, want us telling you what to do. Got I it. don't want you telling me what to do. <laughs> you know, I don't let anybody tell me what to do. So no, I'm just kidding. Um, all right, so I guess th that's it. I mean, I I think I'm all set. I've kind all of right. run out of stuff. So well, we do have our next folks coming in. Is there uh, are there any other announcements that you guys would like me to make? I mean, we have some great um, sessions coming after this. So stay on. There's more chances to win. So stay active in the chat pod. Um, I don't know if it's if it's pillows all day or if it's other stuff. So like, come back and find out. Um, and I think there's some opportunities to do more um, challenges. So, you know, that's a great way to hone your skills and and you know, I kind of kind of you got a free um, professional critique here. So <laughs> that's always awesome. Yeah. Thanks. So up next we have uh, Caitlin and Evan on After Effects. Are you guys going to talk about Mogurts? Yes. 
Oh, there we go. And how to well, build them? Yeah, okay, so if you want to know about Mogurts, stick, stick around, because Caitlin and Evan are going to show you the real deal. <laughs> Ooh, Creative Cloud Pillow, intriguing. Yes, they are very intriguing. Stick around, win some more. They're, they're, they're soft. Okay, All right. so thank you very much, thank everyone, you. for joining us, and this is us signing off. We'll see you again tomorrow morning. Join us again. We'll have more fun tips on video. Thank you.